So we are now at the point where we're going to begin the presentation for the prestigious Bevo Francis Award. And I'd like to start with a quick story about how I learned about the great Bevo Francis. I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, we had a real good senior. His name was Gary Boyce. And, um, and our, my confirmation sponsor was our coach, and he wanted to take us on a recruiting trip to Rio Grande. And we sat in the original Bob Evans farm right across from campus there with Coach John Lawhorn. I was the sophomore that tagged along with a guy who could really play. And um, we sat with him and talked about Bevo Francis and Bob Evans. And that's what I learned about the village of Rio Grande. It's Bevo Francis and Bob Evans. Well, when I heard the story, it was more of a folk tale uh, to me. It almost seemed one of those too good to be true stories, except it happened. And um, eventually I had the chance to meet the man and I will, um, I'm going to defer to Jeff Lanham in a moment to tell the, the Bevo Francis story, but I, I tend to tell the long version of it, which uh, could delay this evening quite considerably. I tend to get a little bit excited about that story. Um, but I want to fast forward to the intent of the award named after Bevo Francis. And I want to let you know that we got the blessing of Bevo himself before he passed away. He passed away on June 3rd, uh, 2015. And just a few weeks before he passed away, we got his blessing to name the award uh, in his honor. And the creation of the award, when Jeff and I talked about creating this award, the purpose was twofold. The purpose is to keep the legacy and the story, which is one of the greatest stories clearly in the history of college basketball, to keep that story and that legacy alive. And at the same time, the second purpose is to honor a group of today's greatest players on an annual basis and ultimately whittle it down to one to honor and bring great attention to our game at the small college level. And frankly, it's working. Um, as such, I would um, like to tell you how this started, though, very quickly. And it started with an idea. I knew the story very well. I've been back to Rio Grande. Fortunately, Jeff was kind enough to invite me back to Rio Grande to speak at the Bevo Francis Classic, and what a thrill. When, when you know the story, I had a chance as a kid who thought this was one of the greatest stories you ever heard to one day come back to campus 25 years later roughly and speak to the, the teams of Bevo Francis Classic about the great Bevo Francis, but it was better than that. I sat next to Bevo Francis, and I sat next to Newt Oliver on the other side. What a thrill uh, that was, one of my life highlights. And so as I talked to Jeff about it, um, as most of you have probably tended to notice, I have a um, tendency to talk a bit and get a little bit excited about things. And I only got probably a half a sentence out when I told Jeff I'd really like to do something in the honor and name of Bevo Francis. And he said, yes, we'll figure it out. We have to do this. And from there, we figured out how that would look and the partnership, what that would look like. Um, as such, I'd really like to thank Jeff Lanham, uh, the athletic director at the University of Rio Grande, and eventually Sheward Folks Insurance to help sponsor this award to bring it to life. We're now in our third year. Um, but I want to just make clarify a couple things about the award itself and then turn over to Jeff. The Bevo Francis Award is a season award as opposed to a career award. We're focusing on what happened in a season. And the criteria that we used is our season statistics. Clearly, statistically, um, were important. But also awards that were received, milestones that may have been passed, records that may have been broken. But importantly, and this is really important, team success was important. What people forget is Rio Grande had won four games the year before uh, Bevo showed up. When he showed up on campus, he averaged 50 a game. Personally, the team averaged 100, and they went 39-0 and 0 in his first year. And then when you talk to him, what was really important to him was, was talking about his teammates. Work, I don't want to steal your speech. But, uh, but really, his teammates were so important and the focus on trying to get it done on the court. So team success is a very important criteria. And then as we dig down to the finalists, and of course, as you can imagine, when we start talking about 13 to 16,000 players in small college basketball in America, by the time we get down to 100, then 50, then 25, and put out the video of the finalists, we're dealing with people who are pretty good, and they had pretty darn good seasons. They all did by that point. 
So we really dig deep into personal character and integrity. And obviously we're here to talk about Emmanuel Terry. And as we present him the award, I'll speak a little bit more about Emmanuel. But I want to make sure you understood what was considered in those criteria. But I also want to let you know that there's a team of people that spend a lot of time on this. It's not one of those where it's just, hey, John McCarthy's going to go pick this and Jeff Lanham's going to go pick it. We have a whole group of people that are part of the Bevo Francis Award Committee representing different divisions and rep representing different parts of the country. And I want to just name those people because I think it's important that you know who they are. Tobin Anderson, the head coach St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Drew Diener, who's here with us today, the head coach at Rockhurst. Gerald Holmes, the head, Holmes, the head coach at Bloomfield. Gary Stewart from Stevenson. Uh, in Maryland, Arlen Galloway from Wentworth in Massachusetts, Tony Dominguez, head coach at Western Washington, Chris Briggs from Georgetown College, Bill Drykosen from Rocky Mountain, Clint Pleasant from Rochester in Michigan, Ryan Kane from Ripon, Mike McGrath from the University of Chicago, Mark Barakoff from Randall, Mike Donnelly, the head coach at Florida Southern, Tony Ingle, man, he's a piece of work. What a fun coach he is from Dalton. That's a little side note. And uh, Rhett Soliday from Vanguard were part of this committee that helped us get to this point. And I sincerely want to thank those people for taking the time. They spent a lot of time on conference calls and returning a ridiculous amount of emails. As you may imagine, I tend to have a few questions, and, uh, and they return a whole lot of emails and provide a whole lot of information, and I am incredibly grateful for those people for taking the time. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up the Athletic Director at the University of Rio Grande, Jeff Lanham. Thank you, John. Um, as it's already been said, your passion is unbelievable with this uh, with small college basketball, and I, I did have the opportunity to work with uh, John in, in championships. Uh, my, I think mine was with soccer, though. I think I was associated with soccer with John for some. So it was just a, um, fun to hear this, uh, however long it was, and get it to this point. And we, we were talking about this earlier, and I'll, I'll get going. I need to say this. You know, this, is, um, this award, this is our third year for this. and. You've heard of another football award called the Heisman, correct? Everybody's heard of that. You realize that in 1940, nobody heard of the Wise, uh, the uh, Heisman Award until now. So we're, we're the start of this award. Uh, and we hope that in 60 years, it's going to be somewhere big in this. We're going to have a huge area. So that's what, that's what we're leading to. And that's, I'm, I'm with John with that talking about that passion that's there. So congratulations, uh, Manuel. Um, uh, really enjoy uh, watching you play and being involved with that. I'm a Union College grad, so I know exactly where um, Harrogate, Tennessee is and Cumberland Gap. So it's, uh, congratulations with that. And congratulations to the coaches here uh, today. This unbelievable, the, the idea of we've got all the championships that we've uh, taken place uh, uh, and, and the championship coaches that are, that are represented here tonight. So congratulations. All right, so I, I, want, I want to I tell a story. So I want you to, you got to help me here um, a little bit with some imagination. So let's think about this. Um, it's January 3rd, uh, 1953. This happened on Rio Grande's campus in a small little community hall. 200 people couldn't fit in there, probably. And Rio Grande is playing a school by the name of Ashland Junior College. Um, ten minutes to play in the game. At that time, they played four ten-minute quarters. Uh, so it's timeout. So we are at the timeout. We're all setting in the timeout. Um, fiery coach by the name of uh, 25 years old, by the way, he was very young. Uh, coach Newt Oliver is looking around at the players and he's saying, tonight's the night. We are going to set a record tonight. What's going on? Well, at that point, a guy by the name of uh, Bevo Francis um, at that point had 61 points going into the third, uh, into the fourth period. So he says, from now on, this is the only guy that shoots the rest of the game. In fact, if the other team tries to hold the ball, foul them. 
get the ball back. We need to have the ball back. So Bevo follows through with that, and he pours in 55 points in 10 minutes of, of that final game for a score 116 points, which at that time was a single record for uh, a, a game, college game. A few weeks later, NCAA said, no, we, I'm sorry, you can't do that because it was a junior college. And at that time, schools played different play. We, we were planned to, trying to play anywhere we can um, where we're located. It was a tough to do that. So I'm going to jump forward one year. The next year, uh, February 2nd, um, 1954, we're at a small gym. Rio Grande is playing again, playing Hillsdale out of Michigan. Um, it's in a Jackson, Ohio. Uh, same thing. We're at a timeout with uh, how many 10 minutes to go, and he says again, tonight's the night, we're gonna do this. So we look at Bevo Francis, that at that time, I think it was 74 points he had uh, going into the fourth period, and uh, he only scored 39 in the last 10 minutes of that game to make the record of 113. Well, that record lasted, um, and that was the NCAA record, uh, lasted till 2012. Um, you understand that during that time that Bevo had it, there was no three-pointers. There was no one-on-one. -on -one. You know that, that people would come across half court and foul Bevo so that they'd give up one point instead of two. That's what they were doing with that. So in that game, he scored 113. He made 37 free throws in that game himself. So that's what, that was the whole purpose of the whole, was to foul him, get one instead of two. So 2012, Bevo always said, he always told me that you wouldn't think that that's going to break, that that record. He said it will be broken because of the three-point line. Well, you, you know who did that, right? Are you familiar with that? Jack Taylor did it at, at Grinnell when he scored 138. 27 of those field goals he made were three-pointers. I think he made seven free throws at the time. And I just, just, just to say that if we put the two together and, no threes here, no threes there. If you take those 27 threes and make them twos, he only had 111. So we still got that. Uh, just to say, all right, I'm just saying that. Not, um, so with, with that, um, we, we want to we look at what was, what was so amazing about what happened in this little village that John described in the early 50s. If we think about 1950 at that time, uh, New York City was the capital for college basketball in the country. That's where everything, uh, the NIT was played at Madison Square Garden, and that, at that time, the NIT was the Final Four. That was the tournament to be played. And that's 1950 is when there were 32 players across the country who had point shaving scandal that was take, that had taken place. And this was a huge, huge black eye on college basketball to the point that um, there, there was very low attendance in games. There wasn't any interest going on with college basketball. And it was a very, very low period of time. Um, schools, um, even um, Bradley, Manhattan University, New York University, University of Kentucky had players that were involved with that. In fact, they just did away with their program for one year, 52, 53, because of this scandal. So it was, it was huge news. It was everywhere. So college basketball was in trouble. And then all of a sudden, we had these two events that took place. Coach, you're talking about moments. These were moments in college basketball that was huge, even to, to, to today. I heard... Uh, Heard Coach uh, Bobby Knight talk about this very story I'm saying now, and he said, we need to thank Rio Grande, Bevo Francis, for college basketball that we have today because of what happened. It created a buzz. It created a, the legend. The, it was a, a hero that happened because of his scoring that took place, not only locally, but this was a nationwide, worldwide events that were taking place uh, to the point that when uh, when we had uh, you know on on campus itself uh, we we've got a at that time we had 98 students that's what Rio Grande had at that time 
38 boys uh, on campus. That was the entire enrollment of the school. Uh, when Bevo came to, came to, the, came to, to campus, um, and, and, it, and it served as, um, how can these small schools be involved with this? How is, how is that even possible? So that's part of that story that, that happened. John mentioned that we were 39-0 and 0, uh, that first year, 52-53 season. Bevo did average 50 points a game. Um, and the idea of people were doubters saying, well, it was because he didn't play anybody. It wasn't anybody, you know, we, we, we were playing the podunks is what it, Coach Oliver used to always use that word. Well, he said at that point, I will play anyone, anywhere, anytime. So 53-54, they played every game on the road. Never played a home game at Rio Grande. Every game on the road. Back up just a second with that. The fall of 1953, the trustees at, the, at Rio Grande College at that time said because of our enrollment, we are going to end our existence at the end of the school year. 1954 will be our last graduation and we'll be done because we can't we can't afford to operate coach Oliver got all these teams traveling around and every place he went was sold out every arena he played in Boston Gardens beat Providence there played in Madison Square Garden beat uh, Miami uh, beat uh, Creighton uh, Butler Miami University in Florida, so they're, they're traveling all over the place. Well, he, he set up deals with every place he was at. He, he um, got money from the gate, was involved with it, had contracts with everybody, and he would bring the money home, and the president would say, Think, they're, now they're able to uh, pay faculty and staff. So we are even crediting this team to actually save the university where we're at because of what they've done with basketball. And so that's, that's part of that whole story that's, in, that's involved there. So with, with that, Bevo, they, they finished 20 and seven that year and Bevo only averaged 46 against the higher levels. But again, it showed that yes, he could absolutely play. Um, and John mentioned that the idea of, um, he said, uh, any time that Bevo talked about his, um, you know, the, the, the deeds that he has done, and dealing with all the scoring, he always, always stopped everybody and said, I, I could not have done this without my teammates. Could not, could not have happened. And it was a special group of individuals, you, you know, to think about that. I mean, I, I don't know if you coaches have said, nobody's going to shoot for the next 10 minutes but one guy. And I, I don't know that that's ever happened since that time. So it, 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 it is a special group that was, that was brought together. And we do every year, every year we have a, uh, uh, a tournament. This, this will be our 36th tournament in a row for Bevo Francis. And we have um, men's and women's uh, teams that come around, around the country. And uh, many, of the, um, many of the team members who are still alive come back. Uh, are, are involved there. So it's, it's a really special, really special time uh, at, at Rio Grande and for everybody associated with uh, dealing with Bevo. Now, just to finish up here and talk about this, I want you to think about the two-year statistics that were involved with this. John mentioned this earlier today with some of the coaches, that in two years, um, Bevo averaged 48 points a game for his career while he was at, at Rio. Um, scored a total of 3,273 points in two years um, span. Um, somewhere around 1,100 field goals and over 900 free throws made in a, in a two year period. And, and understand too that this, this guy was not a, um, wasn't a big, he was 6'9", but he was not a player who played inside at that time period. People shot jump shots from down here, set shots, and Bevo was a jump shot. He shot above his head like we would do today. And the idea that he couldn't score inside because he'd have three or four people around him, We've, we have film of that. He would move out to the corners and move out to the top of the key and, and, and absolutely drain it from there. 
So you can imagine the, the, um, the excitement that was involved with all of that. So I, I think that, um, you know, we, we, have a, we have an old clock in our gym that's in, from the 1950s that we, we want to dedicate it to, to Bevo and the team. And, and this is an example of what he would do. Um, we always called him and said, hey, is this, is this good? Is this you know, something you'd like to see? And he says, absolutely, but I want all the names of my team members on this award or on this um, plaque that we would have. So everything that we do, we always include teammates. And that's part of that character part of this award. So I, you know, I think it's, a, it's an important um, thing for us to realize and understand this, that um, it's, yes, it, that we could conceivably say that he was one of the most prolific scorers in the history of college basketball, without a doubt. I think we can all say that. But it was more than that. It was more than that. It was more of that um, having those connections with those special people that were that were there. And even, even to this day, uh, you know, those guys are, are connecting with everybody. They probably at least, you know, weekly, those guys are in contact with each other. They're all over the country now. Um, so it's, it's an important for us to understand that. And I, I, I just want to say the last thing that we, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm humbled and honored to, to even be here to be able to tell that story and talk about Rio Grande College like this. This is my 29th year at Rio Grande. Um, my father was the athletic director and basketball coach there for 20 years, so I've been a lot of time at Rio Grande. And the idea of being able to tell this story and see other people to be able to do this, I, I want to challenge you to, when you leave, talked about talking about small college basketball, this is a small college basketball story. Tell someone else about Bevo Francis that you didn't know, because if we don't do this, it will disappear. And we don't want that to happen. I think it's very important. I think it's really important for us to be strong for that. Um, you know, we've got many more people to, to receive this award um, down the year or down the years from now. So um, we're looking forward to that. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity and love the, in, the passion that's in this room is definitely is, is here. You can feel that. So uh, I guess without that further ado, we're going to get, uh, get the award up here and go from there. Thank you guys very much. I'd like to bring up uh, my friend and the head coach at Lincoln Memorial, uh, Manuel Terry's coach, Coach Josh Schertz. Come on up. Glad I followed John. The mic is at a good height, so that's rare for me that I'm tall enough to, to talk into it. But I um, want to start by thanking uh, John, small college basketball, everybody with the Bevo Francis committee, uh, as well as everybody else that's involved in making this such a special weekend for all of us. Uh, I know it's, it's been a great experience, all the events, getting to meet such uh, wonderful people. Um, it's just just been uh, something I'll, I'll take with me and remember forever. And, and again, really appreciate everybody making all the efforts. And, and again, it's been an awesome, awesome uh, weekend and experience. Um, it's been a little tough for me uh, personally because I got off the plane and first guy I'm in the car with is, is Andy Bronkma. And he, you know, all he did this year was win a national championship, tie an NCAA record with 38 wins. And uh, he's built an unbelievable program at, at Ferris State. and, and uh, you know, so I, I, um, I ride back with him and then I, I get to my room, I come downstairs for the social and John wants to, you know, introduce me to, to Craig Doty and Craig, you know, he's won three national titles in five years and at two different institutions and I'm trying to wrap my mind around how that's possible. And uh, John whisked me off and introduced me to, to Jonathan uh, Pena who's, um, you know, at Berkeley and, and coaching there and all they've done is win four consecutive national title. So now I'm starting to get a complex, feel a little inadequate. And, uh, but he wasn't done with me yet. And uh, he takes me over and uh, introduced me to a guy that I've uh, really admired from afar for a long time and, and Coach Harry Statham. Um, and uh, Coach Statham's obviously an, an icon in, in our profession and not just because he's uh, the winningest college basketball coach of all time, but because of 
uh, the class and gravitas that he runs his program with and is certainly an inspiration for all of us and, and a high bar to aspire to. So uh, I actually found myself being really, really grateful that uh, John was in the room with me because without him, I would be by far the least accomplished and worst coach in the entire thing. So thank you, John, for hanging tight with me. Um, I do, uh, I, I do want to, because he would be way too humble to admit it, but I do want to uh, thank John. You have, we've been friends for a long time, but what an inspiration, your vision, your passion. Um, I know it's a, it's a labor of love for you, but it's yeoman's work. Uh, you know, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to promote small college basketball is, is beyond the pale. It's, it's incredible. And, um, you know, he understands uh, there's no monopoly in college basketball on great players, programs, and coaches at a particular level that uh, they exist throughout college basketball. There's incredible coaches, incredible players, incredible programs throughout college basketball. And John provides the platform and the spotlight uh, to recognize so many that otherwise would go unrecognized. So I know I speak for everybody associated with small college basketball when we say thank you. We have no better champion, no bigger advocate, and uh, we are fortunate to have you leading the way. Um, there is one other person that does uh, deserve some credit for uh, the formation of small college basketball, uh, the Bevo Francis Award, and really the evening and, and weekend you guys are experiencing, and that's me. Uh, in a roundabout way. Uh, I know it sounds kind of self-serving, but um, in, in a prior lifetime, uh, John was a very, very successful basketball coach. He was a head coach at Wilmington in Delaware, and uh, he moved up and, and, or moved down to South Florida. And we were on staff together at uh, Lynn University in Boca Raton. And it was a long time ago. I mean, it was long enough ago that I had full head of hair and six pack abs and we worked together. Interest of full disclosure, the first part is true, the second part's a lie. <laughs> but regardless, we did work together, and like all assistants, I mean, we were, we were, we were tight. We uh, you know, scouted together, we coached together, we recruited together, we had coaches' meetings together, and boy, did we have coaches' meetings together. And, uh, and, and this was a, you know, working with me was a life-altering experience for John. And I, I know this because within 24 hours, of our last game of the season, John had resigned never to coach again. And, uh, you know, I always thought that it was because uh, John was too smart to coach. Uh, John blames it on the year with me. Regardless, uh, college basketball's loss was, uh, or, or college coaching's loss was college basketball's gain. And uh, so some credit to me for driving John out of coaching in that year we were together. Uh, I would like to thank um, Emmanuel's mother, uh, Angela Spann. Uh, for delivering us such a wonderful, wonderful young man. Emmanuel walked on campus and is, you know, we didn't have to do much, I'll be honest with you. I try to take credit for how good a player and person he is every time I can, but she's here, so I can't. But uh, uh, she raised an unbelievable young man with a beautiful heart and a wonderful spirit and who's just positively impacted everybody he's been around. So thank you, Angela, for that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story on seeing him the first time. So. I'm in Augusta uh, and, you know, getting ready to drive to Orlando for the Nationals. And uh, I know the opulent lifestyle of small college basketball coaches. So we're driving from Augusta uh, to, to Orlando. And uh, my assistant, who was uh, heavily in the fitness at the time, decided that I don't know why there was some benefit to running outside versus running on a treadmill. Now, obviously, you look at me, I don't run. So I don't know what the benefit was, but there was some sort of uh, ancillary benefit to, to running outside. So. I wake up an hour before I'm supposed to leave, and uh, he's nowhere to be found. I go out, I have breakfast, I come back, I shower, I pack up the room. And uh, so we're about five minutes from we're supposed to leave, no sign of my assistant. I start calling his phone, and it's ringing, but it's in the room. So I'm like, ooh, you know, so I can't get him there. So I, I pack up the room, time to go. I walk out in the lobby. I'm sitting there, 10 minutes goes away, 15 minutes goes by. I'm wondering if he, you know, like John years before, is going to abandon me as well. And, uh, you know, 30 minutes in, a uh, fire truck arrives. My assistant's on it. He had got lost running outside, found a fire station, and the fire truck had actually brought him back to the hotel. <laughs> True story. And uh, I didn't even let him shower. We just got in the car and, and took off and, and drove, uh, drove, flew as fast as I could to Orlando. Uh, didn't get a speeding ticket. And as is known to happen in Florida, uh, we get in and uh, towards Orlando and pull into the wide world of sports, and it is just a torrential downpour. And uh, 
you know, the D1 guys are valeting up front. You know, D2 guys and small college guys are parking, as the, guy, the coaches here probably know, the overflow parking in the grass about a mile away. And uh, so I've got I've to sprint a mile to get in and make this game. And I can see the look of disbelief on people's face. I actually can sprint a mile. But I've always been deceptively fast, to be honest with you. And uh, uh, people look at me and they automatically assume, like, this guy's a step slow. And reality is I'm two to three steps slow. So it took me a long time, a long time to get there. But I made it. And uh, the rest is history. We got Emmanuel, saw him at Nationals, recruited him, and fortunate enough to, to land him. Uh, two good quick stories, anecdotal stories on Emmanuel, uh, his, his freshman year. First is, like all of our incoming freshmen, he's in summer school. All our returners are back, all of our incoming guys. And uh, Emmanuel would come to my office every day. This is a true story. He'd come in every day. They'd play pickup in the afternoon. He'd come in my office, and he would be crying. And I couldn't get in. They didn't pick me in the top 10. Emmanuel not only could not get in the top 10, he couldn't even get next or down. He never got to play. Like an hour and a half would go by. He just would watch the guys play pickup. And I would do what any good coach would do. I gave him the Newt Rockney motivational speech. I'd send him back out there. And this went on day after day after day. He'd come in. He'd cry. I wasn't good enough to play here. He's never going to play. I'd pump him up, send him back out. Well, one day he comes in. And I just was, it was late in the summer. I wasn't in the mood. And he comes in crying, I'm going to go back to Alabama. This is, I can't play here. This is, you know, I'm never going to be able to play. And I looked at him, and Emmanuel, I told him, I said, and this is true, Emmanuel. I go, uh, Emmanuel, I was like, you know, you're going to be a great player. I was like, but you're not a great player now. I was like, just imagine if you were one of our best players, how bad our team would be. I was like, you're nowhere close. Like, we would be horrible. So be grateful you're in a program where you're not one of the best players because you're not ready to, to, to impact college basketball yet. Probably not the best approach, but a, a true one. Um, the, the second story is in one of his first practices, he gets his, uh, gets his lip busted with an elbow. And so his lip's all swollen. And maybe the next practice, a uh, guard steals a ball at the top of the key. Emmanuel's at the charge circle. And the guard takes off running down the floor. And I can see Emmanuel sprinting from the charge circle. And time in his steps and the guy goes up to lay it up and Emmanuel flies in, pins the ball against the glass and smashes his face. He's going so fast, he smashes head first into the backboard, knocks his contact out, black eye. I don't know how many of you in here have ever done that, going full speed, <laughs> but I have actually. Uh, it's a true story, I, I was, it was in 10th grade, I was playing in my driveway two on two on six foot goals and went over from the weak side to block a shot, knocked my head against the rim. It hurt. So I had empathy for the situation. <laughs> Details are a little di different, but the story you understand. So I had empathy for, for Emmanuel. Well, the morning, uh, Angela calls me and, and she says, I'm coming to pick up my baby. You're not taking care of him. He's getting hurt all the time. He's got a bad, you know, he's got a black eye. He's got a busted lip. I said, I don't know. I was, like, I was like, Angela, I was like, I promise you, don't come. He won't get hurt anymore. Now, how I was going to do this, I have no idea. The one thing I did institute moving forward was at any time that we were in practice and there was a turnover out front and Emmanuel's team was on defense, I would just blow it dead, kind of like in golf, a gimme putt, you know, like I would just, like a 20 foot gimme, but it would just be like, ah, you know, it's dead. That's two points. There's no way we could have cut, you know, I just, anything I could do to make sure I protected him and that he couldn't get hurt. Um, but he was, he was great. Um, I do uh, want to thank Emmanuel. Uh, it's not particular to him, but um, he certainly, um, you know, as like a lot of our guys, our, our best players, when you can, I've, I've been known to be a little bit relentless and merciless as a coach. So uh, when your guys can take that and they take the hits and your best players uh, are able to handle coaching, it allows you to do your job as a coach because everybody else falls in line. You can hold those guys accountable. And so when your best players have the character and the disposition to, to handle and let you coach them hard and they don't respond, uh, that, that makes uh, your job so much easier. So I'm, I'm incredibly appreciative of Emmanuel for allowing me to coach him uh, these last four years. And his leadership, you know, he's not a rah-rah guy, a super vocal guy, but he was a wonderful example. Uh, through how he worked and, and the standards he had, not just not for other people, but the standard he set for himself. And that drove everybody around him to try to be the best they could be because they saw him trying to be uh, the very best that, uh, that he could be. And so uh, he left a wonderful legacy uh, behind for uh, our future culture drivers to follow. And uh, certainly he accomplished a tremendous amount, but certainly that roadmap that he left is one I hope those guys uh, will follow. Uh, in terms of, of the Bevo Francis Award, um, I would say, in my opinion, and I'm biased, of course, uh, but it's the most prestigious award to me in, in, in college athletics. When you look at uh, the amount of people under consideration, um, I think it's around 15,000 
or so. I'll probably tell people it only was like 30 just to make it sound better, but it's probably 15,000 or so. And uh, it, it's, it's the criteria I think is incredible uh, when you look at not just stats, but your impact on winning, your character, the academic piece. And Emmanuel, uh, the, from an academic standpoint, I know his numbers, you'll see his highlights and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, he worked really hard to graduate in four years and get across that line. Um, you know, worked his butt up. It didn't come easy to him. He spent a lot of time in tutoring, a lot of effort, but he got across that line, got his degree, and, and that's, you know, an incredible accomplishment. Um, I do think he understands the magnitude and, and, and responsibility that comes with being uh, mentioned in the same breath with, with Bevo Francis. And, uh, and I think he'll be a wonderful representative moving forward uh, of this award. And, and I do want to say to Jeff, um, I do, you know, from, from my standpoint, our program, our institution, uh, it's a truly an honor and a privilege uh, to be associated with um, such a quality institution in, in Rio Grande, and then obviously one of the legends uh, when you look at college basketball and basketball in general in, in Bevo Francis. Um, so we were really, really appreciative of this honor. And uh, I'm going to close with this. Um, to me, the uh, best thing about Emmanuel, uh, and it's not going to be anything you're going to see in his highlights, is that with all the success he's had individually and the success we've had collectively, He's never changed. I mean, that's incredible. He's still the same humble, hungry, incredibly respectful, compassionate human being he was when he walked onto our campus four years ago. All the honors, accolades hasn't changed him a bit, and that's a credit to who he is and the character he has as a person, and it's certainly a credit to his beautiful mother, Angela. And um, I just want to tell you, I am proud of you. I love you. And uh, I'm jealous that I can't rock a jacket like that and look that good. So without further ado, I'll turn it back over to my friend, John McCarthy. Thank you. You know, you're pretty good, Church. Nice work. So Emmanuel Terry, as you're aware, is a 6'9 senior at Lincoln Memorial. But here's some of the numbers. Lincoln Memorial this year, we talked about impacting uh, team success. Lincoln Memorial went 32-2 and two this year, spent a good portion of the year ranked as the number one team in America in NCAA Division II. They won the South Atlantic Conference regular season and tournament championships. They were the number one seed in the Southeast region where they reached the championship game this year. For the season, Emmanuel averaged 16.9 points, 10.3 rebounds, and 2.2 blocks. But keep in mind, he only played less than 28 minutes a game because they were mostly lopsided victories as the rail splitters won by more than 25 points per game on average. How about this one? Terry shot an astounding 71% from the field for the season. And he set the school record for career field goal percentage for his career, shot over 70% from, his, uh, from the field. Additionally, he broke the school's shot blocking record this year and finished with 228 blocks. For this highlight reel senior season, he was named the SAC Player of the Year, the inaugural SAC Defensive Player of the Year, the South Atlantic Region Player of the Year, and was named the, to the D2 Conference Commissioners Association First Team All-American and the NABC All-American Team. Now, in regards to team success, I want to throw something out here. I'm, I don't know if what I'm about to say has ever happened in the history of college basketball, in men's basketball, at any level. Lincoln Memorial this year, we talk about impacting success. Think about this, with over 300 teams in Division II basketball, Lincoln Memorial led the country in field goal percentage offense and field goal percentage defense and margin of victory in the same season. I don't know if those three things in the, with the same team with over 300 schools participating, has ever happened. And as Coach Schertz and I talked an awful lot, Emmanuel had a whole lot to do with that on both ends of the court. But as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the Bevo Francis Award, when we get this down to the finalists, I'll be honest, they're all good. They're all really, really good. When you're talking about 13 to 15,000 players, or as Coach Schertz says, maybe 30,000 players, when you get down to the final dozen or so, they're all All-Americans. Most of them have been named National Player of the Year in the respective division, or at least first team All-American. They're all really, really good. So as we did our research on Emmanuel, I want to tell you a couple things I found and things we discussed as we were choosing a winner. Here's a couple things I learned. 
I learned that when Coach Schertz was sick this past year, he took him a card to his house and took, um, took balloons and card to his house. Coach Schertz's son got sick at one point. Same thing, shows up at the house with cards and balloons for Coach Schertz's son. I learned that he came, comes to games early as his celebrity status, so to speak, grew in Harrogate. He showed up early to games so he could meet with the disabled kids and the little boys and girls who wanted to take pictures with him, wanted an autograph. He got there early to make sure that he could do that with those children. And I thought this was really important and pretty special. I know when he hangs up the phone with Coach Schertz, he tells me he loves him. And I learned that he loves his mother deeply. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you turn your attention to the screens as we watch an incredible highlight film of Emmanuel Terry. On behalf of the University of Rio Grande and Sheward Folks Insurance, Small College Basketball is proud and excited to announce that the winner of the 2018 Bevo Francis Award is Emmanuel Terry from Lincoln Memorial University. Emmanuel Terry is a six foot nine senior that led Lincoln Memorial to a remarkable 32 and two season, a number one national ranking and the South Atlantic Conference regular season and tournament championships. Lincoln Memorial won a perfect 20 and 0 in sack play and also ripped off a 21 game win streak. Terry and his teammates were so dominant this season that the rail splitters led NCAA Division II in field goal percentage defense and field goal percentage offense and point differential. Along with teammate Dorian Pinson, Terry finished his career as the winningest player in the history of Lincoln Memorial and the South Atlantic Conference, finishing with an astounding 126 and 14 career record. For the season, Terry averaged 16.9 points, 10.3 rebounds, and 2.2 blocks per game in less than 28 minutes per game in mostly lopsided victories as the rail splitters won by an average of more than 25 points per game. Terry shot an astounding 71% from the field for the season and set the school record for career field goal percentage, shooting 70.4% for his career. Additionally, Terry broke the school shot blocking record and finished his career with 228 blocks. For his highlight reel senior season, Terry was named the SAC Player of the Year, the inaugural SAC Defensive Player of the Year, the South Atlantic Region Player of the Year, and was named to the D2 Conference Commissioners Association First Team All-American and the NABC All-American Team. Congratulations to Lincoln Memorial's Emmanuel Terry, the 2018 Bevo Francis Award winner. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2018 Bevo Francis Award winner, Emmanuel Terry. First of all, I want to give honor to God for allowing us all traveling grace on, you know, and just allowing such amazing people to be here today. Um, Ms. McCarthy, thank you, you know, um, for being a founder of Small College Basketball and building such a great committee. Again, I thank you. Um, social media is a crazy thing, um, yet such an informative thing. I was playing, you know, I don't know if you know Fortnite, you know, it's a game nowadays. Um, when I saw that me along with, <laughs> when I saw that, me along with two of my teammates were, um, were being considered for the Bureau of Friends Award. I had never heard of this award. Um, however, when I got online and did my research, the first thing I thought of was, wow, what an awesome, awesome basketball player Mr. Bureau of Friends was. I literally had to reread the history of his success. I was not sure if it was the fact that he scored 116 points or if he scored 55 points in the final 10 minutes. Um, I was thinking to myself, who does that? But I have to say, his accomplishments was a part of God's plan, and for me to be the 2008 recipient of such an awesome award, I am humble. I believe that Mr. Francis is in heaven, my father, and there I had a talk with the committee and allowed me to be, you know, the Beals Francis Award winner today. 
Um, it is so many people that have been great supporters and you know, such inspirational people in my life over the course of this journey. One person that comes to mind right off the bat is um, Coach Schertz. Um, four years ago, you brought, into this, brought this kid that weighed 183 pounds soaking wet. I had no clue how to play basketball. I ran to a three-point line and pick up <laughs> every chance I got, and I couldn't even shoot. Um, after every practice and every game, I came into your office asking, did I do good today, or how, how can I be great? Um, this, is, this is an everyday thing. You can, you can ask anyone. Uh, how I am right now, I'm the type, I'm a right now type of person. Um, I have to have it. I shed so many tears, and I have thought, what, like you'd have thought of being cut from the team. Coach Schertz, I can't thank you enough for being the role model to me and believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. And I know that you saw me years ago. I didn't know why you wanted to keep me around, but I'm glad you did. I will forever, I will forever be, you will forever be known to me as coach and, and nothing less than me. I have so much respect for you and a lot of love for you. I thank God you found me when you did and didn't let me go. You are a huge reason to why I'm the person I am today. I thank you and your family for taking me in as a player and as a son. You're the best. To my teammates, or I like to call them as my brothers, I'm not just speaking on this past year, I'm meaning all the years of part of such a great program. The amount of respect we have for each other, the last competitive practice, just bonding like a family. It's something that I will always cherish. I thank you for all pushing me to believe in me that every night I will show up and get the job done. My success would not have been done without you. We may have came shy of the biggest goal in college basketball, but when you look at the foundation we built over the years, we can all agree that there were no regrets. We did things that a lot of people say that they can't have done or experienced. These are memories I would cherish 15 years down the road. I thank you and I love you guys. Last but certainly not least, my mom. My mama, Madre, as I call her, the heartbeat of my family. She's loving, loud, proud, bad to the bone young lady <laughs> who will pray for you and do anything for you. I see where I get my personality from. I'm not knocking down anyone's mom, but my mom's the best. <laughs> Let me tell you about a mother's love. A lady who had three knee replacements and was willing to drive five hours for one game on a Wednesday and drive five hours back that same night to make sure my siblings was up for school. A mother who would cook for my teammates on Thanksgiving or just bring the other mothers together for enjoyment. A mother who would be ready to meet a ref outside <laughs> over <laughs> if something happened to a gentle giant, that's me. Um, a bad foul call or, you know, she was ready. The lady I would call when I had a, a big game and asked her to pray for me. She said, son, you're fine. Just go out there and do this. This month on the 25th would be a year that my dad, Otis Terry, James III, passed due to cancer. It was something I sort of seen coming, but I didn't want to. I still to this day shed tears because of this. A mother's love is shedding tears with her son and telling him how proud of a parent he was even when his last days were here. I wish many days that my dad was here, but I know where I'm, when I'm jumping over people and making ridiculous blocks and games, soaring all over the place, but my dad's wings are wrapped around me. I love you, pops. To my mother, Miss Angela Miles, my success is your success. Without your love and prayer, life would be pretty tough. But you're my number one supporter and my number one lady, my queen. When I hurt, you hurt. You had a play, a mother and a father role over, these pa over this past year, and I can't thank you enough. For being such a caring and strong person that you are, I know God is going to take care of me and the family, and you led, and you led me in the right path. I thank God for allowing you to carry me for nine months and holding my hand each step of the way. I love you all so much. Thank you. Okay. I know I said last but not least, but there's one person I'd like to thank. Um, Ezekiel Spann, my baby brother. 15 years old and he's 6'7", almost looking me in the eye. Strong heart and caring person. I never had someone look up to me as much as he does. I try to be the best role model to him and be the best brother. I love and respect him like no other. I may be hard on him sometimes, but it's only because I want him to be great and better than me one day. Um, I look forward to seeing you. At, I always look forward to seeing him in the front row of my games, and, or calling me, asking me how I did, like 
I always do this for you, baby brother. I vow to take care of him and keep him safe from hurt, harm, and danger. I play the safe way because I don't want anything to happen to him or anybody to mess with him. I know that one day God's going to bless us to play against each other in the NBA. I love you, brother. We will play Fortnite when I get home. I had to let him know that. <laughs> um, if you were to ask me four years ago where my life was heading, from being blessed to be a successful player and the person I became today, honestly, I would tell you no. My reason for this is it was as if life threw me in the hardest directions, coming from a small school, limited exposure, playing just one year AAU, and being told I wasn't ready to go to a D1 or D2 school. But the thing is about me is I keep my faith in the man upstairs. I pray every day for him to lead me in the right path and to take care of me. I have been through a lot from injuries, losses, and times where I expected to be, to be last. But in God's word, first shall be last and last shall be first. Every night, I pray to the Lord of stairs to keep me right. I tried every day and every night to be the most consistent and respectful and humble person to anyone that was brought into my life. Helping out in the community, reading to kids, putting on a dunk show even when I didn't stretch. <laughs> These were, without a doubt, the best times of my life. Regardless of the hard times, I know God heard me and my family's prayers. My name Emmanuel, Isaiah 714 means God is with us. I know God hasn't left my side ever since I was brought into this world. With that name, and that name to me means more than what people to expect. You know, you can say it's a perfect fit for me. As I come to the end of this, I just want to thank you all for believing in me and showing respect and support to me over the years. I remember this day, believe it or not, even after all the success and the accomplishments I received, it never really hit me until today. I thought many days my hard work and drive would go unnoticed. But I waited my turn and kept God first, and here I am speaking in front of you today and such in front of amazing people. I thank you once again, Coach Church, my mother, my siblings, my teammates, and to everyone across the nation that know who Emmanuel Terry is. My love for you all will be a lifelong affection. God bless.